the talk I'm giving today is on sociology and economics, so it kind of combines what we've all heard, and probably isn't anything new, but, you know, I've, I'm a soil physicist, and I've always prided myself on my soils research being very quantitative and, you know, pushing the boundaries of uh, what's known and, you know, measuring soils and using new technologies to map and measure soils. But with the work that we did with soil security, which you heard Alex up here earlier today, I remember when we had the first soil security meeting, it was at Texas A&M University, and I was sitting listening to the, the sociology and the economics component of our, of our program, and I would actually helped put together that part of the program, and it was pretty thin. And I was thinking in the audience, like, wow, you know, I, I know so much about soil physics and mapping and pedology, but I really don't know that much at all. But in general, that's what most of what I do know is about. And I was just thinking, man, there's just, why don't, why don't soil scientists do more sociology and economics? And I'll tell you why. It's a diff totally different jargon. It's a different world. And it's very hard to be comfortable with non-quantitative kind of work if that's what your scientific training is in. But I started looking at Texas because, you know, after the soil security meeting, I was, I was fired up. I was passionate. I was thinking, gosh, we got to do something. You know, I drive around in Texas all the time. My husband's is the cotton extension specialist, or was. That's the connection with Bill. And, um, but everywhere I go, I, I'm always looking at the crop, and I'm looking at the soil. And a lot of times, the soil's not in real good shape in Texas. And uh, so we looked at, you know, what kind of conservation practices were going on in Texas. And this is before we had any information on um, cover crops, which came out in the new census. This is old census data. And I started updating this figure. And I thought, well, there's really no need, because this is 2010 census data. But if you look at the new, or 2012, if you look at the new census data, there's no change. There's no change in Texas, and actually in uh, quite a few states that I looked at, in their use of uh, uh, conservation tillage, no tillage. And you can see in cotton and corn in Texas, uh, the tillage is uh, conservation and no tillage adoption is pretty low. And I started thinking, you know, why is that? And um, because all the data out there, you know, the quantitative data, says that this is a good idea. We should go to, to no-till and cover crops and use soil health promoting practices. So I thought, well, it must be a problem um, with the social economic part of it, right? The profitability and, and why don't people adopt? You know, I love the picture of the round wheels versus the square wheels. I feel like that way in my job constantly. You know, am I missing the round wheel? But anyway, I got together a team. Uh, I, I thought, you know, holistically, what are all the issues in, uh, in soil health? And you know, you think, OK, well, you need soil science. And you need economics and sociology. And I was thinking a lot on off-farm uh, kind of effects. So I wanted a hydrologist, because I think one of the, in Texas is about capturing that water you know, from a soil physics point of view. Of course, I would say that. But of course, we're dealing with the rainfall that everyone else is dealing with. And so the first thing we did is um, got a great graduate student who's in the audience, Diana Bagnell. I'm essentially presenting her PhD work. She really ought to be up here. And I said, Diana, we need to go out to these fields. We're going to choose vertisols because that's my favorite, the high clay soils. And uh, we got to find farmers. And what we did, since there's very few no-till farmers, we just went and found no-till farmers. And as Diana would drive around in the truck with a no-till farmer, she'd go, hey, do you have a neighbor that wouldn't mind if I hopped the fence and did some measurements on their field, too? So li literally, we had these paired experiments where we'd go out. Diana took some uh, soil physical and chemical and microbiological measurements uh, of these no-till and cover crop practices. And then she literally just crossed the fence, do some um, conventional practices. And then generally, the farm would show them a place where they had a pasture, so we were looking at that concept of what's the least minimally disturbed soil in the area. And, and in Texas, it's usually um, some perennial pasture. And so this is the cool thing that she got. This is a principal component analysis. And don't really worry if you don't know what that is. What we did is we took all the quantitative data into a matrix, right? And then on one part of the matrix, we had um, you know, what the management was. And then we did all the soil properties that we measured on that soil. And then essentially, principal components here just kind of show you, you know, how they're connected to each other. 
and the colors are the management. And so you can really see that you know, the soil physical and chemical properties are kind of separated, right? You see the, the, the red, which is conventional till, and the blue, which is perennial, and the green is no-till. And so conventional and no-till were pretty, uh, conventional and perennial, so perennial is our reference state in this case, are very far from each other. And then no-till is kind of in the middle. It's kind of gluing them together. But the interesting part about this is the orientation of those vectors that you see in that graph. And what the vectors are showing is that the inherent soil properties are kind of a little bit off, but you can kind of think of that x-axis is showing how they differentiate in their inherited soil properties. So like, you know, what they get, their genetics, the geniform, I think is what Alex called it. And then you can see the, some of the measures that we took, the vectors that are going straight up, aggregate stability and soil structure. So I've, I'm totally skipping out that Diana did a really cool new novel method to measure soil structure. So we're still doing the cool measurements, but that's not the, the point of this talk. But she measured soil structure quantitatively and quickly, and she measured aggregate stability, and that's what's differentiating these soils. Well, that makes sense. We see this all the time, but it's nice to have a, a nice measurement of it and to show, okay, so these soil physical properties are varying, and they're varying just like we want, we think they ought to. And boy, the farmer should want nice structure and good aggregate stability because you saw all those pictures that Bill just showed you. So I'm glad I don't, I'm not having to waste time on pictures. So when you get together with a sociologist and an economist and you talk with them for over a year, the first thing they want to do is they want to go and uh, talk to farmers. They, this was a great part. This is a struggle to get farmers, you know, when you're a soil scientist, an economist, and a sociologist, and you walk into a bar, oh no, you call, <laughs> you call a farmer and they go, <laughs> we really don't want to waste our time with you. But anyway, we were able to get seven adopters and uh, eight non-adopters. And we really looked at no-till versus conventional till, but it turned out when you grab the no-till, they're doing cover cropping too, just kind of a thing that happens, right? And we each did, uh, we did three interviews with them in a group. So we did an interview of the no-tillers no and the, the adopters and the non-adopters. So sociologically, that's what you call them. And we asked them these questions about engaging in practices that promote soil health. And the goals were we wanted to see uh, what changes in soil health were meaningful to them, because we're kind of wondering as soil scientists, how do we communicate with farmers? And then we also want to discover themes around their perceptions, like why are they not adopting? Why did they adopt? And so first of all, since I'm a soil scientist, we have to talk about what farmers thought were interesting. And so Diana, had, we uh, recorded all this data, and Diana went through and did a, a, a sociological method of non-quantitatively looking at words. And these are the words that came up. Uh, greenness of crops, compaction, soil structure, these are words out of the farmer's mouths. And then as a soil scientist, Diana looks at those, and two themes emerge, water management and organic matter. And so we're thinking, OK, those are the things that are important to farmers. We're going to put together a survey, and we're going to include those pieces of information in there. And then the other cool thing that Diana did is she looked at these themes of adoption, right? Remember, we have adopters and non-adopters. And these are really interesting. This is the best part of the talk. This is the best slide of the whole day, of, at least of my talk. And uh, stewardship ethic, you know, what is this ethic to take care of the land? That ethic was strong in both groups. That's not a surprise, right? Like, we all think we're doing the best for our land, our soil. Uh, the next theme, of course, was profitability. That always comes up, and, and we decide this is, this is kind of the gateway thing. This is, this is the theme that's most important for them to consider anything else is the profitability. They all talked about reducing costs. They did not talk about yield. Nobody talked about yield when they talked about profitability. They talked about cost. And then uh, social interactions, oh man, that was huge. Uh, they talked about the suburbanites. You know, they don't like it when they get on their tractor and go down the road and people are honking and trying to get to work. Uh, they talked about landlords, um, talked about rental, how landlords didn't, just like Bill said, I'm telling you, Bill gave him a talk. Bill said, you know, they don't want the soil, they don't want the fields to look trashy. And trashy means not clean rows. Uh, so appearance was a big thing. Family was a huge thing. 
Uh, this one guy who was like one of the, uh, the big early adopters in the area, he, young fellow, his father-in-law bought some property and said, I want you to farm it, but you got to do no-till cover crops. And the guy uh, talked to his father, and his father's like, well, you better do what your father-in-law says, and they, but it's not going to work, but you just appease your father-in-law. And so he did it, and it worked. And he said the next year he came back, he was talking to his dad. He goes, you know, we need to get this on all of our acreage and quick. This is the way to go, right? So the connections were important. The other thing they talked about was tuition, the learning curve, right? You pay your tuition. They would say they got to go to school to learn these management practices, and the tuition that you paid was loss in yield. And so here are some quotes. I put them in green. So one guy said, and he was in the adopters, he has just being new and you just know you don't know all the tricks you haven't paid the tuition yet. He's talking about yield drag. It's it's our screw up. It's not the soil's fault. It's our fault. I just love that quote. (laughs) It's not the soil's fault. It's our fault. They all talked about needing to learn. The other, uh, another quote that we got, they, they talked about mentorship. And I'll tell you the story in a minute, but let me tell you the quote first. He goes, um, you know, you're going to sacrifice yield is what one guy says. And the other person says, no, I haven't lost any yield. And the second guy goes, huh. And then the guy said, but I had an experience. The guy helped me. And then, it's not in the quote, but I remember saying, who did you have help me? He's like, oh, Mr. Klein right here. I said, oh. And they're like, oh, yeah, like half of them had Mr. Klein's phone number, right? And then I said, well, who has, every, who has whose phone number here? They, and this is of the adopters. They all had each other's phone numbers, and they called each other, and they talked to each other, and they asked questions. Now, that was very different in the non-adopters group. They all, excuse me, they all knew each other in the non-adopters group, but they said, uh, you know, the non-adopters didn't have mentors, and one quote was, not in my area, uh, they won't tell you how they, he meant to say how they do stuff, so it's very competitive. So there was not a strong social network among the non-adopters. That was very uh, powerful to, for me to learn that, uh, probably why I'm at the Soil Health Institute now. Uh, so we looked at non-market valuation with our group, and uh, so what the economists did to keep the graduate student busy till we had survey data is they went and looked at angler information and they found that uh, they looked at a willingness, willingness to pay. It's a, a way to look at travel. So they looked at anglers' willingness to pay to travel places that had better water quality. And roughly they got something about, you know, a little less than $20 an, uh, a unit of transparency or conductivity that uh, anglers were willing to pay to get to cleaner water to fish. So we have... Um, there is this on off farm uh, market, right? And then so we're looking at hydrology. I'm going to skip this because we're looking at the, you know the ecosystem service valuation. But essentially, what we're doing now is we've come up with a model, and here's the model. It's an economic social model on adoption, and we're going to quantify this model in a survey and send it out to the farmers so they have quantitative information of what are the barriers to adoption in Texas in this watershed we're working in. Essentially. The first is, is just a linear model, and these are all the, the, the bits. But first of all, we have utility of profit. That's what we all know, the cost, what's it worth. The, utilitary, uh, the utility of non-pecuniary sources, which are the social part, the perceptions, the social capital. Utility of government's assistance, we had to put that in there because it's in there. Perception and management on the access to the parcel. So that's the landowner's component. If you, if you do these practices, do you get out of it? Uh, the value of the soil as it is now, and that marginal improvement in the soil. What's the value of marginal improvement? And so we've made this survey, and it's pretty neat. This is the best part. It's the economic choice experiment, where we actually have real data from Diana's work, and we put it in there so the farmers can choose what they want to do. And so that's pretty much what I had to say today. So the big thing is profitability is the gateway driver. Uh, based on our findings. And then after that, it's about social interactions, uh, and everyone has a nice stewardship ethic. So we're all starting off in a good place to improve adoption over time. 